Oh, oh, okay. Just holding you guys accountable. <laughs> All right, well, come on in. The water's fine. Uh, let's see if there's a handout. Where, where are they, Earl? In the back chair. the back chair. There's a handout, so you'll need one of those. And if anybody needs a book, let let me know. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Are we good to go up there? All right. Praise the Lord. Let's uh, open our Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, and verse 1. If you've been uh, tracking with us, or maybe this is your first time here, um... We have been tracing the whole subject of the kingdom through the Bible, which uh, involves several stops on the bus, and we've, we've gone through five stops already. So our first stop was the Garden of Eden, where we learned that the kingdom that God established was lost to the earth at that time. God the Father wanted to rule through the first Adam who would rule creation for God. And that office, uh, that kingdom disappeared when our forebears listened to the animals. And, and one in particular animal, a talking snake, <clears throat> and rebelled against God. So the kingdom disappears from the earth at that point. So sort of the goal of history is how that structure is going to be brought back to the earth. And of course, one of these days in the millennial kingdom, which we'll be studying tonight, uh, God the Father is going to rule over the last Adam, who's going to govern creation for God. So your whole kingdom program starts right there in Eden. And once the kingdom is lost, uh, we start to see promises developing in what's called the Abrahamic Covenant where God is forming a special nation, uh, the nation of Israel. And it's through that nation that we learn He's going to bring His kingdom program to the earth. And it starts getting developed in the form of promises where God granted to the nation of Israel three blessings. Anybody remember what they are? Land, seed, and blessing. Yeah, and they at that time were given ownership of those blessings. Right? Right? The third stop on the bus is the Mosaic Covenant, which takes us to the time of Moses, where God now spells out a condition in the Mosaic Covenant through which Israel, if she meets the condition, doesn't become the owner, but becomes the what? Possessor. And that Mosaic Covenant ultimately points towards who? Christ. So, until the nation of Israel enthrones the king of God's choosing, which would be Christ, the kingdom will be in a state not of cancellation, but a state of what? Postponement. Good. And the fourth stop on the bus is the divided kingdom, uh, where we learn that uh, because of the sin of Solomon, his uh, polygamy and other things that he was doing, God brought discipline and divided the nation of Israel into two parts, the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. Now, of those two groups, which is the more significant as far as the kingdom is concerned? The southern tribes, good, because uh, Judah is in the south, 
And Genesis 49, verse 10, tells us that the Messiah is going to come from the tribe of Judah. And we know from the covenant that God made with David that the Davidic kings reigned in the south. And so the north is dispersed by the Assyrians about 722 B.C. And God says, keep your eye on the south. So the south wasn't dispersed. They were taken into, into deportation. And once the south was taken into deportation, that was our fifth stop on the bus, which began a period of time called the Times of the Gentiles, which is the period of time when there is no king reigning on David's throne. And Israel is going to be trampled down by various Gentile powers. And uh, we know that the first Gentile power was Babylon, The last Gentile power will be the revived Rome under who? The Antichrist. And only after that kingdom of the Antichrist runs its course, which is yet future from our point of view, from our time period, then the kingdom will come. So the times of the Gentiles concept, and we saw it developed in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, you might remember, Uh, reveals uh, when the kingdom is going to come, after the final uh, phase of Gentile dominion under the Antichrist is deposed of by Jesus Christ at his second advent. So you put these concepts together, and what you learn is that a kingdom is coming, but it's in a state of postponement. You guys with me so far? Now, this takes us to our sixth stop on the bus, which is the Old Testament prophets. And uh, we'll probably, we'll be focusing on the Old Testament prophets probably tonight, and I think there's so much here, uh, it'll probably carry over into next week. And this is where the Old Testament prophets start to give a sketch, uh, a portrait, if you will, of what the coming kingdom will be like. Uh, The kingdom is in a state of postponement, not cancellation. And so if we didn't have a portrait of what it would be like when the kingdom finally arrives, we would lose hope. So that's why the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 19 of the prophets says this. So we have the prophetic word made more sure. Now, in context, made more sure than what? Well, what if you back up in the chapter, you'll see it's talking about Peter's eyewitness testimony to the Mount of Transfiguration when Christ appeared in his glorified state. Now, what is the most powerful form of evidence you can introduce in a court of law? Eyewitnesses. And what Peter says here is the words of the prophets are even more powerful than eyewitnesses. That's how sure uh, Peter is about these prophets and prophecies. So he says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention to. Uh, Because of the certainty of the prophets, Peter says you, you would do very well to pay attention to what they say. Because they function as a lamp shining in a dark place. Now, why is this world a dark place? It's a dark place because the kingdom is not here right now. So the, the, the prophets function as a light shining in a dark place because they start to paint a picture of what life will be like once the kingdom comes. Until the day dawns and the morning star. Now the morning star, according to the book of Revelation chapter 22, is Jesus till the morning star rises in your hearts. So until the uh, morning star and the return of Christ, the world is in a dark place, the kingdom is not here, Satan is the god of this age, but we don't lose hope because the prophets are like a lamp shining in a dark place that we would do well to pay attention to. So if you don't become a a student of what the prophets reveal about the kingdom, the only thing you're stuck with is the course of this present world. And isn't that kind of a depressing subject? 
and that's why everybody's all concerned about world events, and I am too, to a certain extent. But the fact of the matter is, you know, whoever gets elected and the next election cycle, uh, you know, we can be hopeful about things or depressed about things, I guess a little, but the fact of the matter is it doesn't alter your hope at all. Because your hope ultimately doesn't come from the course of this present world. It comes from the picture that the Old Testament prophets present of the coming kingdom. So every worldview out there has an eschatology, a study of the end. And as Christians, we have one too. And uh, we have a very clear picture from God of his plan for this world, which gives us hope in, in a hopeless age. But you really don't have hope until you become a student of these prophets who are function like a light, light shining in a dark place. So Peter says we would do well to pay attention to these prophets. So um, what I have is a list of 14 characteristics of the kingdom from the, from the prophets. And before I even give you that list of 14, I want to take you to three... Uh, sections of scripture all in Isaiah and if you were just to become a student of these three passages you would have a pretty good glimpse of what the kingdom is like and will be like so the first is Isaiah 2 1 through 4 which I had you turn to Uh, just four verses it says the word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem Now it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. So one of the characteristics of the coming kingdom is the nation of Israel is going to be in a place of prominence over the rest of the world. Uh, Israel and Jerusalem is not just one of many. Uh, uh, nations, but she's actually prominent in that time. And it goes on and it says, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion And the word of the Lord will go forth from Washington, D.C. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. So it's picturing Jerusalem as the nerve center of the millennial kingdom. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for peoples. So what's happening in this future time period is completely righteous judgment. So there's no mistakes, there's no miscarriages of justice like we see today. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they study of, learn of war. So it's talking about a period of time of world peace uh, where nation spending you know think of how much of our our budget here in the United States is spent just on military uh, a military in this time won't even be needed because there won't be any wars during this time so that's a tremendous picture isn't it uh take a look uh, a couple chapters to the right there look at Isaiah 11 and verses 6 through 9 It says, the wolf will dwell with the lamb. So that's talking about peace in the animal kingdom. Have you been to the zoo lately? You'll notice that wolf and lamb are in different cages. But not so in the millennium. Or the kingdom. It says, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little boy will lead them. And the cow will and the bear will graze, and their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. So notice that it's a time period where animals aren't even carnivorous anymore. They're herbivorous. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. 
and the weaned child will actually put his hand into the, into the cobra's nest. I mean, think about how startled you would be if your young child, you know, put their hand into the cobra's nest. But in this coming kingdom, that won't even be an issue because the conflict between animals and mankind is called off. And it says, they will neither hurt nor destroy on my holy mountain. So notice it's a time of holiness because you have the righteous rule of Jesus present. And then it says, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So think of a world where Christians aren't persecuted. Uh, you know, a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ, as Earl mentioned, alluded to anyway in his, his prayer today, uh, are meeting, you know, under the cloak of darkness and secrecy for fear of government persecution. You know, even here in the United States, look at how the Bible's been pushed out of the schools and public life. And, you know, a judge in Alabama wants to post the Ten Commandments on his, his wall in the courthouse. And, you know, all of a sudden that becomes a lawsuit. And all of these things, well, the, where the Word of God is pushed out of everything. But in the kingdom, the, the, uh, the earth will be the, the opposite. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. So that's quite a picture, isn't it, of the kingdom. And then go to the very end, second to last chapter of uh, Isaiah. And notice Isaiah 65 and verses 17 through 25. Isaiah continues to give us great depictions of the coming kingdom. He says, for behold, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. Now, I'll show you a little bit later that that's not a brand new earth. That's what we would call a renovated earth. And I'll try to prove that a little bit later. The former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing. So Jerusalem today, uh, the way the prophet Zechariah describes it, is like a, a burdensome stone that causes the nations to reel. And even uh, recently in Paris, the gang of 72 met to further divide the, you know, the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. But not so in the kingdom. Jerusalem will not be a target any longer. Jerusalem will be a place of rejoicing. And her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. Uh, no longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days. Or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100 and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. So, you know, sometimes somebody dies at a very young age. You know, a, a child, a, a teenager, something tragic happens. And we say, wow, isn't it tragic that such a young life was snuffed out? And in the kingdom, if someone dies when they reach 100, everybody's going to be shocked. You know, how sad that is that such a young man... Uh, died at such a young age, at the age of 100. And it goes on and it says, They will build houses and inhabit them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will, they will not build and another inhabit. So today you, you put in a lot of sweat to start a, a business or something, and the government comes, and assuming you even make a profit, the government comes in with state and local uh, and national taxes, and you know, all of a sudden 60% of everything you earn and all the effort you've spent, suddenly that money's gone. And, that's, and where, do, where does it go? It goes to somebody else that didn't earn it. So in the kingdom, uh, you're going to be able to uh, reap the benefits of your own labor. You know, whatever you produce is yours. And it says, they will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, now think of a tree, how a tree survives multiple human generations. 
as the lifetime of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the works of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children to calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. See, a lot of times we struggle with God because we pray and we don't see immediate answers to our prayers. But not so in the kingdom. You, you pray for something and immediately it materializes uh, because the righteous rule of Jesus is present and we're aligned with his righteousness. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. And the wolf and lamb will graze together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. And the dust will be the serpent's food. Uh, they will do no evil or harm on my holy mountain, says the Lord. So what do you think? Are you looking forward to this time period? Here's just the things I wrote down uh, only from those three verses, three sections of Scripture in Isaiah. I call these kingdom conditions. Jerusalem is the center of the earth. It's a time of perfect justice. Worldwide peace, uh, peace in the animal kingdom, the universal knowledge of the Lord, the earth is re re uh, renovated, there is a curtailment of the curse, because the curse did bring death, and the average lifespan today is what, 70 years, 80 years, 90 if you're lucky? Well, here, obviously, people are living a lot longer than that. Uh, there's going to be what I would call authentic, you know, people throw this word social justice around today. But in the kingdom, there's authentic social justice because whatever you labor for, you end up keeping. Uh, it's a time of tremendous prosperity on the earth. And it's a time when our prayers are immediately answered. That's the kingdom. That's the, that's the light shining in the dark place that the prophets are, are holding out for us. So notice Romans 11 and verse 12. Notice what Paul says concerning the restoration of Israel. He says, Now if their transgression is riches for the world... And their failure is riches for the Gentiles. Now let me pause there for a second. We know the story from the Gospels that Jesus showed up and the nation of Israel rejected him. And as the nation of Israel rejected Christ, the kingdom, was, was the, the kingdom did not come in the first century. Uh, the kingdom is now in a state of postponement, not cancellation. And we look at that and we say, what a tragedy. But you all know that God can take lemons and turn them into what? Lemonade. That's God's specialty. So he took the Jewish rejection of their own Messiah, you know, where the Jews had all the evidence that could be mustered by God himself that Jesus is their Messiah. He is the king of God's choosing. And they rushed him through their judicial system, which was a mockery of justice. They, they broke every... Uh, law they had in the Old Testament and in uh, extra biblical, uh, the Mishnah and those kinds of documents, they rushed Jesus through the court system to get him dead. They uh, they they turned him over to the Romans, and we look at that and we say, what a tragic thing that was. But God took lemons and turned them into lemonade because through that transaction, what did God accomplish? The sin debt of the world was paid for. So God took a tragic thing and actually used it to pay the sin debt of the world. And so Paul says, if the Jewish rejection brought riches to the Gentiles, see, we're spiritually rich now because of the death of Christ. Yet there wouldn't have been a death of Christ had the nation of Israel not rejected Jesus, right? So if that failure resulted in riches to the Gentiles, look at what he says, how much more will their fulfillment be? If God took their reject, the rejection of their Messiah 
and turned it into a triumph, think of the greater triumph that's on the horizon. Once the nation of Israel complies with the condition and honors the king of God's choosing. And I think what Paul is referencing here is the coming kingdom. And he goes on in verse 15 and he says, For if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be? But life from the dead. And all the way through Romans 11, he's talking about the future of the nation of Israel. He's just making a very simple point that the Jewish rejection of Christ was tragic, but God brought something good out of it. And if God can bring something good out of a tragedy, think what greater thing is coming once the nation of Israel is in the faith, because that will result in the manifestation of the kingdom of God on the earth and the ultimate dethronement and deposing of Satan. And you don't have this understanding unless you pay attention to what the prophets have said, which function as a light shining in a dark place. So that's the introduction. (laughs) You can see why this is probably going to bleed into next week. But what I have here, I I just want to give you 14 conditions of what the kingdom is going to be like. I mean, we've already read several of them in those three sections of Isaiah that we read just a moment ago. But here I'm kind of delineating things a little further and trying to give us a picture of the coming kingdom, which is so well developed uh, by these prophets. And God specifically raised up these prophets for many reasons. One of their primary reasons was to give us a picture of the coming kingdom. So here we go, 14 conditions. Uh, I'm taking all of these from the prophets. And uh, one of the tragedies of putting this study together is all the stuff I had to leave out. So I can just give you a Reader's Digest version. Because this is a, if you you really want to get into what the prophets say about the kingdom, that's a, a expansive, massive, massive study. So here's at least the Reader's Digest version. Uh, so you can get the flavor of it. The first of the 14 conditions is that the coming kingdom is going to be established by God. Uh, Daniel 2 and verse 44 says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. So this kingdom that's coming is not the work of man. It's not the work of some kind of political strategy. It's something that God physically sets up uh, on planet Earth. The second characteristic of the coming kingdom from the prophets is that it's going to be eternal. It's going to last forever, in other words. Daniel 7 and verse 27 says, His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. Now you say, well, how can it be eternal when John tells us it'll last a thousand years in Revelation 20? Well, what you have to understand is the millennial kingdom is going to be followed by the eternal state. So the millennial kingdom is sort of like the front porch to a house. It does last a thousand years, but once you pass it and you move into the eternal state, the eternal state is called the eternal state because it lasts forever. So Revelation 20 is sort of the front door uh, or the porch, and Revelation 21 and 22 is, is the house that follows. So this kingdom will be eternal, and this kingdom will last forever. Number three, this kingdom will be exhibited by Christ's direct rule. Jesus himself is going to be orchestrating this kingdom. Zechariah 9, 9 and 10 says, Behold, your king is coming to you, mounted on a donkey. Now that was the first advent, which the Jews rejected. But then Zechariah 9 and verse 10 goes into Christ's second advent, and it says his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. 
So what it's revealing is the wor world-wide uh, rule of Jesus Christ. Christ's direct rule over the earth. And what God is bringing back into existence is the structure that existed over the human race prior to the fall of man. God's original plan was to directly rule Adam, and he was to govern creation on God's behalf. And uh, we studied that, did we not, in Genesis 1, uh, 26 through 28, um, where Adam was given uh, authority over the animal kingdom. He said, subdue, rule, and those kinds of things. And that was lost in Eden, and God is bringing this back in the thousand-year reign of Christ, where God the Father is going to rule over, not the first Adam, but the who? The last Adam, and he's going to govern creation for God. That's the plan of human history. And God, in Genesis 1, said to them, plural, Genesis 1.26, subdue, rule, in other words, it was Adam and Eve together. So when Jesus is governing this earth for God the Father, he's going to be with his Eve, ruling and reigning. And who do you think that Eve is? It's the, the church, which is the what of Christ? The bride of Christ, then it'll be the wife of Christ. See that? So the millennial kingdom is the direct rule of Jesus Christ over the earth. Uh, the fourth characteristic of the coming kingdom is it's going to be earthly. And a lot of people will take these promises and say, well, that's just talking about uh, you know Jesus in heaven and, and our enjoyment with Jesus in heaven and things like that. But that's not what the prophets say. It describes it as earthly in nature, just like Eden was earthly in nature. Zechariah 14 and verse 9 says, The Lord will be king over all the what? All the earth. So it's very clear that we're dealing with here uh, what we would call an earthly kingdom. The earthly kingdom, which will follow the earthly return of Jesus Christ to, the, to this planet, is, starts getting described as early as the book of Job. Now, what's the oldest book of the Bible? Book of Job. And in Job 19 and verse 25, it says this, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will take his stand on the what? On the earth. So, the, the problem with uh, Christendom, Christianity, is we fell under the spell of Augustine, or Augustine, however you want to pronounce that. Depends on which syllable gets the emphasis, as I like to say. But he, in the 4th century, took all these promises and said, you know, uh, these are really heavenly in nature. Um, he was uh, someone that was influenced by Gnostic thought. Gnostics basically believed that the spiritual world was good and the physical world was bad. And that seeped into Christianity, and that started to mess up a lot of doctrines. Uh, one of the doctrines that got messed up was the incarnation of Christ, that Jesus came in an actual body. And that's why you see statements in 1 John about who is the Antichrist, but the one who denies that Jesus has come in the what? In the flesh. Uh, 1 John 4, <clears throat> verses 2 and 3. And another doctrine this destroyed, this Gnostic thought seeping into Christianity, was the doctrine of the earthly kingdom. Because I'll be showing you in this series that the church for 200 years believed in exactly the way I'm talking, in an earthly kingdom. In fact, they made it a test of orthodoxy. If you didn't believe this, you weren't even considered an orthodox Christian in the church for the first two centuries and then Augustine came along, influenced by Gnosticism, and he began to say things like, you know, all of this uh, physical stuff is really carnal. And so they took all of these promises that God has given specifically to planet Earth and began to kind of celestialize them. 
and make it sound like they were heavenly, and they basically began to rewrite these prophecies. So even today, many people uh, have very limited knowledge in the church within Christendom about their the coming earthly reign of Christ, and they really don't understand that they are going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ on planet Earth. Uh, Revelation... Five. I, I was trying not to quote the book of Revelation because I wanted you to see that this earthly kingdom idea uh, is really starts in the Old Testament. But Revelation 5 and verse 10 says, You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign where? Upon the earth. doesn't say anything about us being in clouds, you know, strumming harps, wearing white sheets or whatever, halos over our heads. Um, There is an earthly, uh, heavenly program. We're with him for seven years in the Father's house. We'll try to explain that later in the series. But that's just limited. We're coming right back to the earth to rule and reign with Jesus Christ on planet earth. And very few Christians understand this. And even in our songs, what do we talk about all the time? Uh, Heaven. And uh, the way we evangelize. Do you want to die and, and, and go to heaven? We talk about heaven all the time. But the reality of the situation is the the Scripture is placing a lot more emphasis on the earth. And we've lost sight of our earthly future. Uh, And so we learn here with characteristic number four that uh, according to Zechariah 14 uh, and verse 9, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. This is a terrestrial Uh, earthly kingdom. Now one of the things people like to do with these promises, you see how I've got the tribulation period, the second coming, the thousand year kingdom, and the eternal state. One of the things people like to do is they like to take all of these earthly promises and transport them to the far uh, right of the chart. And they like to say, well, these are, this is not talking about some kind of thousand-year reign of Christ which precedes the eternal state. This is talking about the new heavens and new earth. The fact of the matter is, and I'll be showing you this over and over again through this chart here as, as we progress, these prophecies are not talking about the eternal state. One of the reasons they could not be talking about the eternal state is because Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 18, talks about people not wanting to go to Jerusalem to worship Christ. And what you have to understand is that the kingdom is repopulated by believing survivors of the Great Tribulation period. And the earth after the Great Tribulation period will be quickly repopulated. And what is passed down through the bloodline, the sin nature. And so the kingdom is a very interesting time. You have the resurrected Jesus ruling and reigning with his church, us, in resurrected bodies ruling and reigning, but you've got a group of people on the earth that will need to be ruled over with a rod of iron because they will still possess a what? A sin nature. That's why Jesus has to rule with a rod of iron during this time period. And that's why you get little hints of grumblings in people. They're not going to want to go to Jerusalem to worship, but they don't dare uh, express themselves. You know, they don't destroy campuses and things like like people do today when they have these these tantrums. Um, And so they just bottle up their resentment against Christ. And you'll see that very clearly in Zechariah 14. 16 through 18, it says, Then it will come about that any who are left of the nations that went up against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feasts of Booths. And it will come about that whichever families of the earth do not go up to worship Jerusalem, uh, up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. Rain is R-A-I-N, not R-E. I-G-N, but God immediately judges uh, any rebellion. They don't get moisture for their crops. And this is a manifestation of Jesus ruling and reigning along with his church with a rod of iron. It says, if the family of Egypt does not go up 
or enter the no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the feast of booths. Now, let me ask you a question. Can that be describing the eternal state? It can't be describing the eternal state because there isn't any sin in the eternal state. Uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4 makes that very clear and a, a number of other passages. So a prophecy like that can only fit this unique time before the eternal state begins when you have two classes of people living on the earth, the resurrected Christ along with the resurrected church, and I'll throw into the mix resurrected Old Testament saints and resurrected tribulation martyrs. Uh, Daniel 12.2, Revelation 24 and 5, many passages describe it, but you have people who survive the tribulation period, who pass through the sheep and goat judgment. And you'll find a description of this in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And uh, they are called sheep, and they enter the kingdom, not in resurrected bodies, but in uh, mortal bodies. And, they have, and the kingdom starts with all believers. But they have children, their children have children, their children have children, and the sin nature just gets passed right on down through the genetics. So the kingdom is this unique period of time where you've got resurrected and unresurrected people living together on the earth. And you say, well, this sounds like a science fiction movie. This is really weird. But think about this for a minute. We have a precedent for this in Scripture. There is a 40-day period in between Christ's resurrection and ascension as described in the book of Acts. And that period goes about 40 days, and he's instructing his disciples. And do they not have a meal together during that time? And they're interacting. He's asking them questions. Uh, They're asking him questions. And there's dialogue going back and forth. And they're even touching Christ. Remember Thomas touched Christ. So what I'm saying is there is a precedent in Scripture for resurrected and non-resurrected people to be dwelling together. And that's basically what the kingdom age is. And that's the only way to make sense of a passage like Zechariah 14, which talks about a rebellion that's smoldering in the hearts of people, but it isn't expressed because of the Jesus ruling with a rod of iron. Zechariah 14, 16 through 18 doesn't fit. The, the far, uh, what are we there, the far right of the screen, the last two chapters of the Bible. It only fits this intermediate 1,000-year uh, time period. So what is the coming kingdom going to be like? It's going to be earthly. The fifth uh, condition that the prophets describe is the kingdom is a time period when the land promises are going to be realized. Remember the plot of real estate that God promised to Abram all the way back in Genesis 15? Remember we studied that in the Abrahamic covenant? It's a plot of real estate that goes from the river of Egypt uh, to the Euphrates. It's basically modern-day Egypt to modern-day Iraq. And where is this, uh, when is this, are these land? And remember Abraham, who was then named Abram, walked around the land. Remember we studied that, that he would possess? So it's got to be talking about soil on this planet. And when is this going to happen? It's going to be fulfilled in the Millennial Kingdom. So everything that God has promised in the covenants to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to be fulfilled at this time. Now when you study Ezekiel 47 and uh, verses 13 through 23, what you discover is very specific information is given concerning how that land is going to be divided amongst the 12 tribes. So there's sort of a pictorial representation, if you will, of what Ezekiel 47, verses 13 through 23 is talking about. And people say, well, let's just make that the eternal state. Well, it doesn't fit the eternal state. Why? Because 
Ezekiel talks about tribal land. The eternal state is talking about tribal city gates. Talks in the eternal state about the new Jerusalem, but it never says, to my knowledge, that the land is divided. What it says in Revelation 21.12 concerning the new Jerusalem, the eternal city, it says it had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of who? The sons of Israel. So in the eternal state, each gate of the city is named after a tribe. That's not the way the millennium is described, where they're actually given a specific plot of real estate. So once again, a prophecy like this does not fit the eternal state. Uh, The only place it logically fits is the thousand-year kingdom that leads up to the eternal state. And continuing on here uh, with our list... um, Once these land promises are realized, what is promised is that the land of Israel will never be divided again. No division of the land. Remember when the land of Israel was divided? After whose reign? Solomon's. Uh, The ten northern tribes called Israel were divided from the two southern tribes that were then given the name Judah. And you read passages like uh, Joel 3 and verse 2, and that's where you discover that the nations of the earth prior to the return of Christ are going to be obsessed with dividing the land of Israel. And this is exactly what we see today, isn't it? What are are these uh, international groups always saying? Well, Israel has to give up more territory to, to guarantee peace. So they're always talking about dividing the city of Jerusalem. Uh, you know, they gave up the Gaza Strip uh, back in, what, 2000? They elected in Gaza Hamas, a terrorist organization, which uses that strip to build tunnels uh, so they can go into the land of Israel and kidnap people. I was actually in Israel, my wife and I, when those youths were kidnapped, coming home from school, those Jewish youths. And they used that area, and on this map it's called Philistia, what's called the Gaza Strip today. They use it to launch rockets into the land of Israel. And you see how well this two-state solution works. Well, now the world community says, let's just try it on a bigger scale. So you're not going to just give up Gaza, you're going to give up what they call the West Bank, which is really uh, Judea and Samaria. So there's a perpetual desire to divide the land of Israel, and Joel 3 and verse 2 indicates that that's what's going to bring, bring God's wrath to the world in the tribulation period. He says, they've divided my land. So this is an obsession of the nations, And it's a division that actually started after the time of Solomon as the land was divided between the northern and the southern kingdoms. But guess what? In the millennial kingdom, no more division of the land. Ezekiel 37, verses 21 and 22 says, Say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations, Where they have gone, I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. And one king for all of them. They will no longer be two nations and no longer be divided into two kingdoms. Uh, The book of Jeremiah, chapter 30 And verse 3 predicts the exact same thing in the millennial kingdom. It says, For behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. Thus says the Lord, I will bring them back to the land that I gave them to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. He says, I'm going to restore the fortunes of Israel and Judah. That's the north and the south. Coming back together and living in harmony. 
And never again will the nations of the earth uh, divide this, this land. So the kingdom is a time period when all of these land promises expressed in the Abrahamic covenant and also expressed through the prophets indicating the land will never be divided again. It's the time period when all these land promises are going to be realized. A sixth condition of the Millennial Kingdom is it's a time period when Israel is preeminent. Uh, Israel in the Millennial Kingdom is not some sideshow off in the corner, but she is the preeminent nation. That's what the prophets predict. Isaiah 49 and verse 23 says they, that's the Gentiles, will bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick the dust of your feet. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Zechariah 8 and verse 23 says, In those days, ten men from all of the nations, Gentiles, will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. So there is a recognition once again that Israel has a very special role that she's playing in that time period and people are attracted to God and they know that Israel is God's special nation. So so the nations of the earth, ten Gentiles are grabbing the garment of one Jew. Zechariah 8 verse 23. We've already read Isaiah 2 and verse 3, haven't we? For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from where? Jerusalem. Not Brussels, not Washington, D.C., not San Francisco, uh, not any famous Gentile city, but the nation of Israel is the nerve center of the Millennial Kingdom. And this is why in the book of Revelation, when Satan is released from the abyss, John talks about it in Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9. And he's given one last chance to wage war against God. And he summons the nations who have been living in perfection for a thousand years. And that sin nature has been uh, kind of boiling, but hasn't been allowed to express itself. Satan is released and people have one last shot to rebel against God. And it says in Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9, those involved in the rebellion are as the sand of the seashore. So we're not talking about a minor rebellion here. And what do they surround? They surround which city? It says it very clearly, the beloved city. Now do a study of the beloved city in the Old Testament, and what you'll discover is the beloved city is always a reference to which city? The city of Jerusalem. Now why, why are these rebels and Satan attacking this city? Because that's the headquarters. To take over, you have to attack the headquarters. It's, it's the nerve center, if you will. And uh, so, I, uh, let's see, Isaiah 49, 22 and 23 talks about this. Zechariah 8, verse 23 talks about it. Uh, Isaiah 2, 2 and 3 talks about it. A passage I read earlier, Zechariah 14, 16 through 18 talks about this because they won't want to go to worship Jesus on the Feast of Booths. And where is Jesus located at that time? The city of Jerusalem. That's why there's this smoldering rebellion in the hearts of people against the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Isaiah 14 and verse 2 talks about the preeminence of Jerusalem and the Jewish people during this time. It says the peoples will take them along and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them as an inheritance in the land of the Lord as male servants and female servants. They will take their captors captive and will rule over their oppressors. So all of these nations that have subjugated and bullied Israel, all of these centuries and millennia, millennia in the millennial kingdom find themselves 
uh, actually being ruled over Israel, the very nation that they subjugated. And that's what these prophets seem to be predicting. And you have to watch theologians very carefully on this issue because what they'll play is this little game where they'll say, well, I believe in a future for Israel. And people say, oh, okay, they believe in a future commitment to Israel and God's future plan and program being fulfilled through Israel. So they're okay as a theologian. When people say, I believe in a future for Israel, they are grossly, grossly understating what the prophets predict. The prophets do not predict a future for Israel. They predict Israel is the future. Do you see the difference there? Israel is not just one of many nations in the millennial kingdom. That's what a lot of people are trying to pass off today. But that's not what the prophets predict at all. It predicts that Israel is the head and not the tail. It predicts the preeminence and the prominence of Israel. Jesus is ruling and reigning over this earth from the city of Jerusalem. And uh, let me see if I could squeeze in one more here. A seventh characteristic of the millennial or coming kingdom as revealed in the prophets is the millennial temple. There is a millennial temple described in Ezekiel 40 through 46, really. And it's described in such detail that it's impossible to say, well, that's just an allegory. It's, it's described with more detail than Noah's Ark itself. It's described with more detail than the Temple Solomon built in history. So if you're going to play this game of, well, it's not literal, then you have to deliteralize Noah's Ark. You have to deliteralize the Solomonic Temple. The, the, the level of detail in Ezekiel's prophecy of the coming temple is, is mind-boggling. In fact, it's so mind-boggling it becomes impossible to spiritualize it away or allegorize it uh, away. Ezekiel, here's a, uh, some pictures of the temple. That's its comparison to Herod's temple, size-wise. Look at how big this millennial temple will be in comparison to Herod's temple, which you remember from John 2, I think it's around, what, verse 46, somewhere in there, uh, Well, maybe not verse 46. I'm not sure if there's even 46 verses in that chapter. Uh, Well, it's in there somewhere. You guys can find it. It's in John 2. Where they they said it it took 40 years to build this temple. So it was a very attractive temple by the time of Christ that was rebuilt by the exiles that came back from Babylon. This would be Temple 2, because the first temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, you'll remember, just prior to the deportation. So the exiles come back, they rebuild the temple, Herod comes along later in biblical history and beautifies it. And this was the temple that the disciples were so impressed with. They were pointing out to Christ on the Mount of Olives. Look at the beauty of the temple. And this is where Jesus in Matthew 24 says, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left on another. This temple is going to be torn down, which it was by the Romans in A.D. 70. But that green uh, picture there is the size of Herod's temple. And look how big Ezekiel's temple is there on the left by way of comparison. Look how big Ezekiel's temple is compared to the tabernacle that Moses constructed. Look at how big Ezekiel's temple is compared to the majesty of Solomon's temple that the Shekinah glory of God entered. And look at how big Ezekiel's temple is relative to a, uh, a football field. We all watched the Super Bowl. Think about that giant football field that we were all watching. Look at how big Ezekiel's temple is by way of uh, comparison. And this is the temple that the Shekinah glory of God, what? returns to. Remember, the first temple built by Solomon that the Shekinah glory of God entered left, J 
just prior to the deportation. And last week I tried to make the case that that's when the theocratic kingdom left the earth. You recall that? And what Ezekiel predicts is there's coming a glorious uh, millennial temple that the same Shekinah glory of God left from in the days of Nebuchadnezzar is actually going to return to. And that's the return of God's theocratic reign over the earth. And that's a millennial passage. Now, again, people play this little game. Well, let's just put Ezekiel's temple into the last two chapters of the Bible. Does it fit there? It doesn't fit there because Ezekiel 45.22 says this, On that day the prince shall provide for himself and all the people of the land a bull for a sin offering. So there is something, uh, it's described in Hebrews 9, verse 13, of ceremonial cleansing that the priests are going to have to go through to take care of their duties in this uh, millennial temple because the Shekinah glory of God will be present. Now, let me ask you a question. Can Ezekiel 45, verse 22, fit the eternal state? It doesn't fit there at all, does it? Because in the eternal state, there's no what? There's no sin. If that weren't enough, according to Revelation 21 and verse 22 of the eternal state, John says, I saw no what? Temple in it. So number one, there's no sin in the eternal state. Revelation 21 verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain for the first order of things has passed away. That's number one. Number two, there can't even be a temple in the eternal state. Because Revelation 21 verse 22 says, I saw no temple in it. So the only logical play, unless you just want to wildly pretend that this prophecy isn't saying what it's saying, in which case you have to dismiss all of the in-depth uh, uh, graphic depiction of that temple. Unless you want to just wildly allegorize it away, the only place it logically fits is not in the eternal state. By the way, is this temple in existence today? There is no temple in Israel today. So if it's not being fulfilled today, and if it's not going to be fulfilled in the eternal state, where are you going to put it? If you care about details, you've got to put it somewhere, right? Right? The only logical place it fits is in that thousand-year kingdom, that unique period of time where you have resurrected and non-resurrected people dwelling together. So I hope you're sort of getting a picture uh, of what this uh, coming kingdom is like. Established by God, eternal, Christ's direct rule, earthly, the land promises are realized at this time. Israel is going to pr be preeminent over the nations of the earth at this time. And it will be a time period with a functioning millennial temple. And guess what? We only made it halfway through our list. So we will look at the remaining seven descriptors of the coming kingdom from the prophets next week. So I will stop talking at this point. And I did well tonight. It's only 8.02. So I'm only two minutes over, and we'll dismiss folks to uh, pick up their kids if they need to do that.